from Boston, Massachusetts, it's theCUBE, covering Cloud Foundry Summit 2018. Brought to you by the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman and this is theCUBE's coverage of the Cloud Foundry Summit 2018 here in Boston, Massachusetts. Happy to welcome back one of our earliest and favorite guests of theCUBE, Pat Zakic, <laughs> who's at Pivotal now and he handles PKS and Dell Technologies. Yep. Chad, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Boston area. You come through this area a lot, but yeah. uh, uh, it's, it's great to see you. It's good to see you too. This is, by the way, my, it's my first CF Summit. Um, so it's, it's interesting, you know, you and I have talked together at, at, at Dell Technologies World, Dell EMC World, and Dell and you know, EMC World for years. VM World. And, and VM World, this is a, it's a different scene. All right, so Chad, this is my third time doing this show. I was at the first one back in 2014. Yeah. Um, I, last year we did the Cube there. Um, and every year, uh, it's like, oh wait, there's this cool new technology, you know, containers. Uh, maybe, how's Pivotal going to yep. deal with that? Oh, we're, we're going to do that. This year, you know, wait, Kubernetes mm -hmm. and all, you know, cloud natives everywhere. Yep. So, maybe give, give us your point of view as to, to how, how this fits in. Yeah, so, um, I feel like I'm, I'm a kid in a candy store. Um, my job inside uh, Pivotal is to drive PKS, so uh, Pivotal Container Service that's built on top of Kubernetes. And there's a lot of Kubernetes action occurring here. Uh, if I had to net it out, I'd say a couple things. Number one, um, we've moved past the early hype cycle and actually went through several hype cycles that blew up. So Docker is going to take over the world. Not correct. What turned out to be correct is Docker would become the container standard, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, it's Moby now, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, then we went into the battles of different cluster container managers. So it's Swarm, it's Mesos Marathon, it's Kubernetes, and there were lots of others. And then, you know, you get through that early hype period and things settle down to the point where they're actually productive. And everyone now kind of agrees that Kubernetes is the standard, uh, you know, container cluster manager um, for broad sets of workloads. Great. Now the debate is, Cloud Foundry, the structured PaaS world, right? The structured platform opinionated versus the little more wild west and open ecosystem of Kubernetes and then early stage Kubernetes uh, projects like uh, Istio and, and others, right? Um, I think this, ha this has two chapters now in front of us. Number one, chapter number one, and this is my focus I think for the next few years, is how do we make Kubernetes simple enough, easy enough, uh, and frankly, enterprise ready. Uh, not that it's not ready today, but a lot of Kubernetes projects that our customers are all over the map, difficult to sustain. We want to bring a lot of the lessons learned over the years of Cloud Foundry to Kubernetes. Um, and uh, I'm happy to say that uh, just a couple days ago we released PKS 1.0.2. Uh, and 1.1, which we haven't announced the date, but we've always said that we're going to be in constant compatibility with GKE, you know, and, and the core Kubernetes. So since GKE shortly will have Kubernetes 1.10 support, you can expect a 1.1 uh, of PKS. Um, so mission number one is make Kubernetes a great platform, and I am determined and stubborn and will make PKS the best enterprise platform for customers that are putting workloads on Kubernetes. That said, Kubernetes isn't standing still and neither, neither is the ecosystem. And you can see that there's a lot of discussion over what's the intersection between Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes. I think that over time it's inevitable that these things come together more. Um, but again, I, I think that's going to occur over years, not in a heartbeat. And even, you know, I've been at the Kubernetes show now for a bit, and I've been at this show a few yep. times. It's not a monolithic stack. Yep. It's, you know, we're building distributed lots of different pieces. You go to the Cloud Foundry, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the show that's KubeCon. Yep. You know, there's so many different projects there. I mean, Istio was all the buzz, yep. talk about the, you know, service mesh and all those pieces. There's all these little pieces there. At this show, we're talking about you know, Zipcar came and talked yep. about, oh, they love everything in this ecosystem. They don't use some of the core yep. components, but they use all these other pieces. So it's not like, as you and I talk many times, Chad, you, if, you know, people go read, you know, Chad writes a little bit about some of these <laughs> things to give you all the, you know, the details there, but stuff's pretty complicated. Yep. Um, 
there are some in the Kubernetes community that's like it's never going to get simple. Yeah. Um, you know, you know. Re remember when we thought cloud computing was simple? And if you've been to any Amazon show and you go through, you know, it is more complicated to configure a compute instance in Amazon than it is to buy a Dell server these days <laughs> because there's more options <laughs> yep, uh, yep. out there. So, um, look, customers need options. Customers, many of them will want things to be packaged and serviced and buy it as a service, but some love to put those pieces together and it's, it's a spectrum and I loved it this show. Google and Microsoft up on stage talking, you know, hey, open communities collaborating together, yep. maybe not merging everything, yep. but working together, understanding where things fit and it's not one or the other, it's many customers will choose both. There's, you and I are both nerds at heart. I hope you don't take offense. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I, I've, I've already been doing Star Wars quotes yeah. this week. So, <laughs> so uh, I, no I wear it with pride, yeah. right? Um, I'm always fascinated by the technology itself, but one thing that's been really cool about uh, my experience alongside now inside Pivotal, and you can see it here at the CF Summit, is that the, the Pivotal obsession is about uh, the customer and the outcome. Um, we, build we build a platform that is an essential part of that, but teaching the world how to build better software um, is a, a noble mission. And the thing that's the most exciting for me is actually when the customers talk. So if you went to any of the, the customer discussions, did you see any of them? Did you see the T-Mobile the one? I, I, I saw T-Mobile up on the keynote, I actually did an interview yep. with T-Mobile, had, had an interview with US Air Force, that was The Air Force one is amazing, awesome. right? So, you know, it's fascinating from a technological standpoint to say how do you use these tools, um, but it's the story of what you do with it that actually matters so much more. Yeah. And and uh, you know again I I'll leave I'll leave the I won't leave the customer name out of it. So in talking with the T-Mobile crew, they love the Pivotal application service. So they are using it. It's an essential part of how T-Mobile works. They talked about it on stage. That's why I don't mind talking about it. Yeah. Um, and if you ask them, it's not an or, they also have massive projects, massive application workloads that don't fit in PaaS, but are Docker images, they're currently doing some strange stuff with Swarm and blah blah, and they're like, man, if you guys can basically deliver a great platform that we can consume instead of trying to construct and maintain, we trust you, you iterate with us, you work with us, we'll be able to focus more on the outcome. The thing that I'm actually the, going to be the most curious to hear feedback from customers over the next couple of years is how do they navigate what workloads are best put into Kubernetes? How does Kubernetes sets of ecosystems start to um, not calcify, but like firm up, right? It's, it's going to be loose, right? But, but it will start to align more over time. Yeah, our research team actually calls it, uh, we, we need to get to a place where it's more, it, it's plastic. So yeah. there should be not just scalable, you know, uh, yeah, uh, kind of up and down, but, you know, side to side a little bit more too. Right. And uh, once you have it, and you can be able to go. Figuring out over time and helping with customers figure out, hey, this is a, this is a, uh, you know, Kafka or a crunchy, you know, data Postgres instance, or it's an ISV stack, or it's an application that they've homegrown, but they don't want to fully compartmentalize and put on PaaS, and they decide that they want to put it on Kubernetes, awesome. What is the value and the return of doing further work on that app to really make it cloud native, pull out all config, de you know, turn into a sets of small microservices, and then it's better fit for the PaaS part of PCF. Figuring out that formula over the next few years is going to be really cool. Yeah, um, you mentioned culture. Yeah. And that's been something you, know, you and I, Chad, lived through. It was like you know the server versus the storage versus the network <laughs> and the virtualization admin and then the cloud admin. Um, I, I loved, I talked to uh, the, the, the US Air Force guy. Yeah. Uh, and, and he was like, we actually take off, have the people take off their uniforms because rank would have a certain meaning inside there. But you've got you know the devs, you've got ops, you've got still the infrastructure pieces on top. What are you seeing from the customers you're talking to? What are some of the, the big challenges that are slow 
slowing people back from reaching this utopia of, you know, fast, 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 agile, interoperable, <laughs> wonderful times. Like, how do I answer that one? That's a loaded question, brother. Um, <laughs> the biggest impediment is human nature. <laughs> you know, it's these damn humans. Yeah. If we could just get all the humans out. But everybody's mine. We'll mine. Go, we'll, go mine. To, we'll go to low code, no code, eliminate all the humans. It, I, I did dreamy. one of those interviews today, too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we, you don't need all programmers. The, it's, the, uh, you know, ever the business people can the, do it. The, uh, the human tendency for control yeah. and the need for control, I think it's probably pretty deep-seated in our, we're living in a world where we know intellectually that we don't have control over everything, but we hate that because we want to create control in our lives. That basically is the thing that sets up boundaries between people and they get really hung up on their function, right? Um, that's not new, the words change, like you said. It used to be like server people versus storage people and then it was virtualization teams versus the silo teams. And then, you know, now it's the intersection of uh, the dev team and the DevOps team, the operations team, how do they intersect? The places where they're the most successful is that they don't get hung up on that and the people blend the roles. Now the trick is how do you do that in a big company? I, I, I wrote a blog, I'm not trying to advertise virtualgeek.io, but um, I wrote a blog on this which was a synthesis of all of the customer dialogues I've been having over the last few years. And the pattern that I've seen that is most successful is actually to recognize that there are stacks, and the stacks, I don't mean like this particular technology choice, but the way that the whole stack driven by the business and the application and then the uh, abstraction it sits on, and then you have to build your actual operations team underneath that, that creates a whole operational model which in itself is a stack, right? And just so it doesn't sound like I'm describing something that's nonsensical. You know, a stack can be in big enterprises, there's a mainframe based app that's running on a mainframe that's being supported by a mainframe operations team. And then right beside it, there's another stack which is all x86 workloads that are static. So they don't need an IaaS, they just need to run on a kernel mode VM abstraction. And then underneath that you have the team that supports it. And then you've got the workloads that can be containerized and don't need a full-blown PaaS, and then you have another one which is a full-blown application service you know, model. Each one of those stacks ends up with different people, processes, and tools because they're mapped to the cultural operational model of that stack. And the thing that I'm trying to guide customers when I'm talking to them is don't reject that. That's actually reality, right? Yes, you should move as much as you can to the highest order abstraction you can. That's goodness, right? And it pays dividends all the way down the stack. But don't go and say that this workload by definition has to go there, or because you operate this way in this stack and this group operates this way, that by definition you're stupid and they're smart. The other rule is that... Ch Chad, the answer to everything is serverless. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, I should have said that's another abstraction even to the right of the application service model, right? Um, so. The thing that I found is that, you know, a, a key kind of pattern of good is that between the stacks, people and process are not allowed to transverse them, right? Because the process is, is linked to how you operate. Um, the only thing that goes between them, because in the end, for any customer, they have stuff that touches all of those, is to become religious about one thing, which is that APIs and data and how those transit those different stacks, that you have to be very clear on. Do you, do you know what I mean? I wrote, a, I drew, on the blog, I drew a picture, but it was terrible. It was a terrible drawing. I've done whiteboards with you, Chad, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Great, so, sounds like you've got your hands full. Yeah. Um, you know, lots of us read the S1, so pivotal, you know, margin towards an IPO. I guess you know, you, you, you've only been there over a short time, you've known Pivotal yeah. since the beginning and mm -hmm. all the pieces since you know, Green Plum was part of EMC, Cloud Foundry was part of uh, VMware. Anything that you've learned since you've been inside Pivotal now that just, there's misconceptions. One of the things I always find is, we always learn about something the first time and then don't think it changes, yep. so, you know. <laughs> it, it, um, it's funny actually, uh, that's an insightful question. Um, having joined the team, it's weird because to many of them, I'm new, I'm a new pivot. 
Um, but to many of them, they know that I've always been there. Um, and I was reminding some of the originals the crazy tortured path that we've taken to get to today, yeah. right? Um, the original effort was, hey, people are doing new things and it's data's at the core of it. And that was the trigger for the Green Plum acquisition. And several of the people who are the senior leaders of Pivotal now came in through that. And then Paul Moritz was the CEO of VMware at the time and he's like, hey, I'm seeing people build new apps in new ways. And, and by the way, there's this crazy team inside VMware working on this thing called Cloud Foundry. And they were, they were like, a red-headed stepchild that's not PC, but like a black sheep, or I don't know what metaphor you want to use. But basically they were working on something that had nothing to do with, you yes. know, kernel mode virtualization at its core. Yeah, it, it was a cloud native peg in a VM square. It right, was, uh, yeah. and at the time VMware isn't what they are now too, right? Like, so, so and then, um, and then people forget this, but I wrote a blog about it, so it's on the internet permanently, right? Um, there was a Green Plum project, which was a great idea, that says people want to collaborate with data sets and data scientists want to work together. And it's really hard. Let's build a thing, which is like a social media portal for Green Plum, which was called Chorus. And the Chorus project was completely sideways. And they were like, we don't know how we're going to get this thing on track on time. They asked around the valley and people said, hey, you should go talk to these guys at Pivotal Labs up in, in San Francisco. What they do is they help people when they're stuck, right? And they went, and I remember when Bill Cook and Scott Yara came back to Hopkinton and said, this was awesome. They've changed the way we think about how we build software. We think we should buy them. Uh, and, and that got added. I remember when Paul Moritz said, Spring is available. It's like the most widely used modern Java framework and now there's all sorts of stuff in, in, in Spring Riff. All of these weird bits, you know, in essence became the essence of Pivotal. You know what I've learned through that? Is these journeys are not in a straight line, right? Like everyone's, right? Is the, like our careers. Yeah, like our careers, man. <laughs> um, that's the first part. The second thing is, is that and this is going to be a challenge for Pivotal, uh, honest, you know, if we're very transparent as always, is Pivotal's brand is, in, is now so linked with Pivotal Cloud Foundry. And that's a good thing. Like those customers raving about the business outcomes that they're getting. But inside Pivotal, the strategic change, the strategic pivot, ha ha ha, to do a full embrace of Kubernetes, um, versus the traditional uh, opinionated versus uh, plastic uh, debates. Um, I wouldn't say that we have 100% of the company fully embracing it yet because companies are themselves organic, right? But across the vast majority of the company, it is something understood that it's an imperative for us. Like if we want to help the customers and the world build better software, we've got to do it for stuff that fits into paths and stuff that doesn't. Um, and so I've learned over the last uh, you know, few weeks about how many people share that passion that I have, and I think uh, we can make something awesome with PKS. All right, well with that, Chad, we'll have to leave it there for now. Looking forward to seeing you at more events. Congrats on the new role. Uh, I'm, I'm sure if uh, people haven't already, Chad does have a new site for yeah. his blog, virtualgeek.io, instead of uh, the, the, the previous bad. one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so Chad, always a pleasure, thanks so much. Got theCUBE here at Cloud Foundry Summit. I'm Stu Miniman, thanks for watching theCUBE.